first thing I want, wanted to ask you guys about is sort of take advantage of the fact that we've got you know a lot of uh, of interesting people from Hollywood here and the games business, and you know we, we keep talking about this convergence between games and Hollywood, and and you know I've been in the business for 15 years, and I've I've heard this time and again about how everything is coming together, and it's great. We're going to use you know the best of movie talent with the best of game talent. Um, is there something really happening here? I mean, we look at you know. Yair and Jim, you guys are, you know, obviously involved with great movie effects houses that are, you know, creating digital assets. People are talking about, you know, are we going to take those, put them in a video game? Being you come from the video game world where you guys are creating great digital assets. And, you know, you even hear things about like Ubisoft, a company up in Montreal, is starting its own, you know, digital animation facility to make short films. And so they're moving over into the movie realm. Is What's going to happen here? <laughs> Well, yeah, that's right. Square made a uh, yeah, Square made a uh, which is a Japanese game company made a uh, uh, animated film called tragic. Final Fantasy, a tragic film, yes, which I believe was distributed by uh, Sony, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I buy the sequel on why. DVD. <laughs> actually, <laughs> that's actually true. Advent Children yes. sold sold like crazy, actually. Yeah. So we see, you know, I guess what I'm getting at is, is this really? Are we seeing convergence in a new way now? Is it really happening now that the technology is bringing games and Hollywood together? Thing. Um, yes and no. So, in uh, when the the Xbox 720 comes out, um, if Moore's law keeps going, um, it looks like there should be video game systems in 2012 or 13 that can directly use assets from uh, ImageWorks and uh, uh, LucasArts, um, the pre-rendered, you know, the, the human-created assets. So I think there's going to be real pressure on uh, these epic games and uh, um, 100 plus million dollar films to co-use assets. Right. Uh, but at the same time, uh, EA's most ambitious game right now called Spore, uh, I think that by Will Wright, by Will Wright, that 90% of the assets used by um, uh, by players for that game are going to be created by other players. Right. So we're kind of YouTubizing um, um, video game making. So just as the traditional media companies are under pressure from uh, uh, kind of peer-to-peer uh, sharing. And their traditional media, I think that's going to be kind of a, a, a third uh, pressure point in uh, how games, how interactive and traditional linear media come together. Right. At, at Electronic Arts, we have hundreds of, uh, of artists previously doing uh, digital work in traditional Guys media. So it's, a, it's a, the same, well, not Pixar. No, uh, nobody leaves Pixar. Uh, uh, if If... <laughs> Almost of it. Um, if you get a chance to go on a tour of Pixar while you're at Stanford, take advantage of it. Steve uh, Jobs has amazing taste. Built a magnificent building. Right. Definitely, they should teach a course on steal, how steal to build a facility. Well, and, he, and their continuing education program is pretty great. Right. Anyway, somebody else talk. So, yeah, are we seeing games? Uh, you know, you're a guy well, that sees I, it I actually think sides. I actually think EA did a. You know, I, I, I talked about this a little at DICE. I mean, I think that they took Saving Private Ryan and made it into a whole genre of gaming. With Medal of Honor. Uh, with Medal of Honor, and then, you know, people have taken it beyond with Company of Heroes right. and Call of Duty, and you've basically got, you know, a whole subcategory of gameplay. But that's not, that, you know, Saving Private Ryan the game, which I think a lot of people think of, you know, games in Hollywood. But, but, like, I, but I guess that's games, the right? point. You got, I think you've got to think about it more broadly. I mean, that the, the point is the convergence is actually bringing a positive overlap in the two experiences, right. not a direct one-for-one one mapping. I think a direct one-for-one one mapping is just plain lame. Right. I think the question is, you know, do really good ideas... <laughs> well, so we <laughs> also distribute that. We didn't build that. Yeah. I think that they can talk yes. to that. Um, but I, I, I think that that's the point, right, is that, you know, I, I think there's going to be more and more stuff where people pull what's great out of a movie world or a movie story mm -hmm. and take it to the next level. And that isn't going to define all of gameplay, but I think it's going to be a big chunk of, of what gaming's about. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I hope that Will Wright level innovation continues forever, and I think it will, you know, I think both medium are going to continue to grow, but I think you'll see an overlap that's meaningful for people. 
I, I just have the other thing is uh, there's just starting to be people like you in who are successful in uh, in Hollywood who understand both businesses. I mean, when Electronic Arts started out in the early 80s, there was nobody in Hollywood who understood how computers were. There's nobody who played. So right? now I you mean, got Spielberg, Lucas, Zemeckis, um, some big names are deeply committed to uh, uh, to digital technologies and uh, to gaming, and we're starting to see people that grew up on Nintendo um, who can wear Armani and kind of cross over. So I think that's um, the human factor that's also going to make this convergence or uh, cross uses possible. So yeah, I actually don't think it's going to be that generation. I think it's going to be like we had a a kid literally direct um, Monster House. Right. And get kid's name's Gil Cannon, and basically Gil modeled a lot of the look and feel of the movie on what he liked about his video gaming experiences. Hmm. And he brought a style and sensibility to character design and environmental design and movement that was shaped by his video game. I think you're going to see like a generation of filmmakers right. that basically bring you know, their best Halo 2 work into how they set up a shot. I mean, Samantha, are you seeing that in, at Warner Brothers, you know, inside the studio system there? I mean, people are, there's a greater understanding of games and an interest in, you know, making great product that brings the two worlds together? Absolutely. I think that um, people that are making great content understand that it comes down to the user. It comes down to the consumer and what they want and understanding what the consumer wants. And if there's an incredible universe that has been created, making sure that that universe is translated in different ways that appeal to different types of consumers right. so that a movie has something that is very appealing to its subset and a game has a different type of subset, but it's still the same broad universe that we all know and love. Right. Jim, obviously you guys had a lot of experience with, you know, doing movie games, uh, you know, tied into, you know, Star Wars and, you know, Jones doing other products and obviously with ILM being there, I mean, you're, you you guys are sort of trying to be on the bleeding edge, I guess, of that sort of collaboration, well, right? Yeah, I, I guess I look at this whole convergence thing because I get sick of it after a while. I mean, you know, in three levels. One, there's sort of technical convergence, and that's definitely happening. Right. And Yair yeah, can speak to this. But, you know, we we definitely have an asset in industrial light and magic. The problem has been what Bing pointed out is we don't have the, the platforms that can support that kind of – uh, a, a graphic fidelity, yeah. fidelity, but nonetheless, um, what we're trying to do is, uh, and we have, is tap into proprietary ILM technologies, particle physics systems, things like that, um, that have existed in their world and actually get them to work in runtime, and to, to do that in a very accessible way. And we've we've done that. We've created an editor that sits on top of our core infrastructure to be able to do that, and you'll start seeing that showing up in, in a lot of our games. But we didn't get around to figuring that out until like just like a year and a half or two years ago, and that's been right. seven years in, in the working. So uh, that's definitely happening. Then there's like sort of creative convergence, and, you know, and I think some of that's good, um, but the, the games are different than movies, and this right. whole thing about, you know, being with all due respect, we're going to get, you know, great name talent and stick them in games and pay them a lot of money, and that's going to sell more units. It doesn't work. No, and, and, no, you know, okay, well, good. Uh, you know, uh, and or, you know, we're, we're going to we we're going to adopt the Hollywood agent system and have writers and pay out the ass for all that. It's like, forget it. And, you know, uh, then there's the business convergence issue where I think for a while anyway, and I think people – hopefully have smartened up, there was this idea that that video games companies were going to kind of model themselves after studios. And that, right. that's sort of like insanity because studios per se are lost leaders in the whole revenue chain. And so to model them after a studio is kind of like saying we're purposely going to go and lose money. It, it, it's a whole different thing. And it's not necessarily wrong. Because there are multiple revenue streams, is that what you're saying? Like yeah, you know? look, yeah. We, you know, look, a studio makes a movie, it's going to lose money, but it can right. earn it back in all of the other revenue streams down the line from uh, DVD to free television sales, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, it, traditionally in the game business, we don't have a back end. It's right. one shot at retail, that's it. There's not a lot of margin there. You got it and it's it. There's no back end. Now, hopefully with online capabilities and microtransactions and all of that, we now hopefully will have a back end where we can draw out a revenue stream over time. But anyway, so so I, I think there's there's multiple levels to this and it's just to the degree that we, we need to we need to kind of take 
the great things about Hollywood, which, which, which there are great things, right. and adapt them into the video game world and, and then figure out, you know, to how to do the best it thing. seems, you know, we're... I think you're right that you know we're seeing technical convergence, but then I you know see a game like a Gears of War, which was the best-selling you know Xbox 360 game last year, visually stunning, looked like it sort of took a, you know a lot of sort of you know, tropes from you know great cinematic films, but then the writing in it I thought was absolutely horrendous, and the dialogue and the storytelling. Yeah. And I'm sort of, you know it's like, but gamers didn't really seem to care. I mean, it sold three and a half million units, and it didn't see you know would it have really sold that much more if they hired you know a, a Hollywood you know David Franzoni to write the script for it. And well, maybe not with the existing install base, fair right. enough. But look, this industry has been flat for the past five years. We've been selling the same games to the same people over and over and over again. And we're at that, that famous tipping point where right. we either figure out how to broaden the audience, write content that brings in a broader audience, or we just kind of default into this niche market that will never be the leading edge of entertainment. we got right. guys in their basement in the dark playing you know, video games. And that's okay. There's a business to be made there. But if this is really, truly going to be the leading edge of all entertainment, we got to get a chicken in every pot, meaning a device in order to play games. Right. And those pr pr those devices have to be priced correctly so they're accessible. Right. And then we got to have the content that brings more people in. And how, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm agnostic. I don't care what the device is. But we just need to be able to do that. And, and uh, you know, hopefully that's what's going to happen. Well, I think that device is out there for most of the world. I mean, for most of the world, that device is the PC. I mean, we, we can talk about the Xbox 720 and right. the PS5, and I, I'm obviously really vested in that. But that, and it also ties into your point about writing. I mean, the reason World of Warcraft is as dominant an experience as it is is because users are creating text. Right. right? Users are creating experiences. And there's a lot more PCs out there than there are anything else for people to play on. No, I agree. And then it's just, you know, it's it's you know, doing things like, like Bang and EA have done in terms of The Sims and, and even Spore where you're you're really pushing that envelope mm -hmm. of trying to, to not just create, you know, a, a first-person shooter. So can you push that on? You know, because a lot of the things we hear about convergence with, you know, Hollywood, it seems to be all about we're going to have this director consult on this game, we're going to have this writer, we're going to get this actor. It's like, you know, are we seeing any... Is, is Hollywood where we need to go to help expand the audience, or should the industry be looking elsewhere? Well, I think Yair's right. I think there's a new generation of young guys that get it, and they've played video games, and they think in that way. They think both in video game terms and movie terms, and I think that helps it definitely, definitely right. a lot. But the market expansion in the last five years, uh, The Sims has got uh, 75 million packages sold, 60% female audience, most of whom were not previous gamers, a quarter of them. Um, their interactive entertainment had been confined to dolls and telling boys what to do. Uh, and uh, uh, we've got a casual... And they get to do both, in a sense. <laughs> we got a, we got a casual game uh, site, but the, the rise of casual games, there's 25% uh, of Americans are playing, and uh, um, Pogo subscribers are, play, are playing as many hours a week as World of Warcraft subscribers. And that's 70% female. Uh, those are two new audiences, and I would argue that Nintendo, with the uh, uh, the DS Lite, and now with the Wii, is also um, either re-energizing uh, previous gamers, but but certainly heading more toward gender neutrality. And with Brain Age, uh, the concept of Brain Age, I have heard, came from a 72-year-old board member who couldn't play any of their other games. So we're starting to see uh, games for uh, uh, for people whose thumbs don't work at one frame a second, uh, and and uh, all of those inventions have been done by uh, people with technology training <coughs> and not storytelling training or movie making training. Right. So it's coming from kind of imagination and technology. You know, it's sexy to say, hey, we're doing the video game based on this big movie and we're going to have these, you know, stars involved and whatnot. But is that, you know, until, you, until, you, until you do it once. Right. Well, that's, is that sort of, you know, that's kind of a crutch when you, people should be focused more on other types of creativity, do you think? Or, you know, should, you know, should not necessarily be looking at Hollywood, but I, be looking at the, the great, sciences or. Well, but I think the great thing about gameplay is it relies on the user's creativity more. I mean, right. it, there's a fundamental difference between interactive entertainment and storytelling. I, I think the whole point of storytelling is that we want you to imagine yourself in our story and empathize with one of the characters that we created. 
Right. And the whole point of gameplay is for you to be the character. I, I think those right. are fundamental, I mean, to, to Jim's point about the creative convergence, those are fundamental differences that I don't believe will ever go away. Right. Uh, yeah. But the, the fundamental question is, can there be better storytelling, though, in, in interactive games? And, and right. you know, I think the answer is yes. And I don't think we've gotten there yet. And, but you'll have yeah. to pay writers out the ass to do that. I mean, that's that. I mean, that's why the that's why well, they're paid that much. No, right? you have to pay writers who can write movie scripts. That, that's right. So and the writer, again, do they know enough the, about the games? writers that play the, the writers that write movie scripts? You have to pay out the ass because they have agents and they got Hollywood, and that's the way it is. And you guys all, excuse me, you do that down there, and you pay those guys. But what I'm saying is, there's a lot of great talent out there where. You don't have to pay them that, and you get them in there, and let's start figuring it out. Well, you know? Yeah, you, you can pick them up off of YouTube, and you'll get that quality writing. But I, mean, then I, you look I, at like, I believe that there's a talent what? marketplace. I mean, but you look I, at I think Gears of War, and it's like, I mean, it's written by a game writer, and it's pretty bad. So it's like, I, yeah, well, maybe, but maybe there's a good game writer you could get as opposed to a Hollywood writer. But you know, I well, guess on the Hollywood sports. side, though, there's writing for a movie, and then there's writing for a game. So just right. because right. you can write a brilliant movie doesn't mean you understand the interactivity that you actually are writing for right. in a game. So there is a different marketplace there, and they might not necessarily translate back and forth. That's so right. You, yeah, I mean, you know, being you guys are you know working with you know Steven Spielberg on upcoming games and whatnot. I mean, there's certain you know directors that obviously want to bring something to the video game realm. And, you know, yeah, Spielberg does not start out in the movie saying, "Okay, here's what I know about three act stories, right. and we're going to impose that, and now you guys try to figure out how to work within my three act boundaries." Right. He starts much much deeper than that, but he has familiarity with uh, uh, with games. I remember talking. Uh, uh, I have met, don't know a lot of them, but um, uh, the A-list writers, the A-list writers can't afford to uh, uh, write for games. Uh, they just, some of them just play them. Right. But the, the story for The Sims, The Sims um, that I mentioned before uh, was in development for seven years. It was primarily an architecture game. Um, at its core, it is an architecture simulation, and instead of a, uh, a numerical score, there were these stick figures, and um, whether they liked it or not was kind of the scoring of how good the architecture was. And we met a guy that you've never heard of named, you've heard of, named Danny Bilson, who was kind Light of a, sec a second-tier second -tier writer, director, uh, but a Rocketeer, gamer. He wrote a gamer, and he did writing for The Sims, and The, Sim, the Sims characters don't, don't speak, they speak a... Uh, um, kind of a sound effect language called Simlish. So what he did is he created uh, micro-narratives, moments. The boss comes over, the jealousy moment, the kid moment. And uh, he, he wrote us, you know, here, here are 30 things that happen in every sitcom that always work. And we put 15 of those in. And right. uh, before he got involved, The Sims did not have careers or children. Right. So I think the um, understanding the basics, not necessarily the... Uh, it's not the dialogue, it's just sort of the, the storytelling. The, 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 um, the, the, the dialogue that makes trailers work, you know, the Make My Day or the I'll Be right. Back, um, just gets lost in a 20 to 100 hour game experience. Right, he's got games, you know, movies, so two you hours. Can, you, can pay, you can pay a writer a couple million bucks to come up with five good lines and, you know, five good locations and then... Um, something that the actors believe in, right. and we got to get. I think in uh, John Madden football, we have 20,000 lines of dialogue. Right. So, but has, so has there been an overemphasis? You think in the past, but I mean, you guys have done a lot. You know, you've done your Sean Connery Bond game. You've done, you know, a lot of movie games in the past. I mean, has there been an overemphasis on that stuff? Uh, you know, instead of creative new games like Spore, or you know, are we going to see even more of that stuff because there's this convergence happening? Um, no, I think uh, uh, the first the first celebrity game we did was Dr. J and Larry Bird go one on one. Right. And up until then, all sports games that had celebrities, it was, the celebrity was as involved as they were in a T-shirt. They were just pasted on the front in Mattel and television, and they got paid a lot to do a TV commercial. Right. And uh, uh, Dr. J had never done an endorsement. He came to EA to see if he wanted to be a shareholder and do a game, and we sat in a design room and. Uh, uh, we talked for a while, and he was so inspiring that the 18-year-old kid, Eric Hammond, working on the game, ended up basically doing eight iterations on the animation of the finger roll just to try to live up to Dr. J. The same thing happened with us early on in John Madden when consumers didn't believe that Madden was anybody but a fat hardware salesman. Um, 
they so inspired us that people went the extra distance. Right. So I think um, finding inspiration <coughs> is priceless. Working with license or rules and regulations is a total pain. Right. And you know the the uh, there's always a battle about who gets profit margins, but the hardware companies get some and the license store gets some. Electronic yeah, Arts in the 80s was the publisher to Lucas when uh, uh, Lucas himself told um, Lucas Games they could do any games they wanted as long as it didn't involve a Lucas film property. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, I mean, you know, Star Wars, you know, very protective in the past, I think, of that property. And you guys now, you know, with Star Wars Galaxies, you did with the IR, I mean, you guys have opened up sort of the Star Wars, you know, canon to, you know, a little bit more, you know, room to sort of play around with that, right? That's been conscious, Jim, to sort of, you know, let... Because that was always challenging, you know, with games, based on movies, like you could only do the play the movie game, you weren't allowed to change any of the characters, you couldn't have a character die in the game, because what would that mean for the movie world, you well, know? Well, the, the first Star Wars games actually weren't even tied to a movie, and, and, right. and Bing's right. And then also, uh, the, the first games from LucasArts weren't even Star Wars games right. at all. Right. Uh, Ball, Ball Blazer, Rescue that's on Ball Fractalus. Ball Blazer and Rescue on Flactalus and all that, Which and even in the mid-90s awesome. with, you know... Sam and Max and Grim Fandango and, all, and there's there's a lot of new IP that came out of that organization and we lost it and now we're trying to get that back again. Um, but uh, you know we went through years of of sort of uh, uh, taking that that franchise and trying to skin it on every genre known to man and the majority of those games sucked. Right. They just did and every once in a while you got a co-tour that came along and it was fine. But um, so, you know, what we tried to do was uh, reevaluate that and, and really do something that was uh, true to that brand and, and limited and, and, and do something really good. That's what the path we're on now. But, you know, we did have the opportunity to, to trailblaze again with, with Yair and, and Sony Online. You know, I mean, they, you know, EverQuest is kind of it. And then, you know, wow, Star Wars would be a really good example of how to take this thing. And look, it doesn't compare to a wow, but that, but. My God, this is the number. It was the number two MMO for a while, and then WoW's taken it to a whole new level, you right. know. And, and it, it served its purpose, and it's great. Because well, all both, you guys well, have done online, you know, games, you know, yeah. from you know, Samantha with Matrix Online, being you guys have done, you know, Ultima Online, and uh, you know, Sims, Sims Online, online Earth and Beyond, Motor City Online. Right, right. lots of like people have history is littered. <laughs> but everyone sort of experimented in this space, and that's something that you know. There's a lot of talk now about Second Life. See a lot of cover stories in business magazines, but you know these virtual worlds and, you know, how it's sort of the, you know, next great business opportunity to, you know, not necessarily just build the game, but, you know, build virtual items that people can buy in these games and whatnot. And, you know, we, we've seen that on the PC, like you talked about, you know, the PC has been big for that, but I mean, the consoles really haven't, uh, we haven't seen a lot of successful massively multiplayer games on the consoles, especially here in the U.S., I, but but you're really only in the infancy of Xbox right, Live, let alone the PlayStation Network, which is well, only live for like two months. So I is mean. that? But it, so is that the next? You know, is that a next huge opportunity here in the gaming business? Is these sort of massively multiplayer? You know, for people who don't know, it's you know, it's a persistent world game where you pay a subscription fee every month, and you have sort of a virtual avatar that can go around and socialize with other characters. Uh, and persist in this, you know. I don't think world. it all has to be massive, but but I'm, right. I'm I'm kind of a big believer that gameplay is a communal experience. I mean, I, I I think that you know your experience on Madden when you play by yourself and when you play with a bunch of buddies is completely different. And right. and uh, and if you join a league, it's completely different. And and I so it's not all going to be like millions of people playing in the same world. It's not right. all you know. And and there are all sorts of limitations that come with that in terms of how you shape the world. But I think. Every every game is going to have a communal component, and I believe that ultimately a majority of the players will be playing communally, right. e- even if they're playing poker or, or you know bridge at, at Pogo. Because Bing, you guys went down that path of doing a lot of those online massive multiplayer games, and you know pulled back. I think the whole industry sort of pulled back a few years ago. Uh, you know, the way EverQuest was really successful, and I think there was, you know, a litany of sort of games that came out, and a lot of them, you know, were not particularly successful. Well, World of Warcraft did a couple things that kind of broke the rules. Uh, one is it was a, um, um, a playable, kind of uh, well-balanced and addicting single-player game. Right. And that that was a rule breaker. Burning Crusade that just came out is another rule breaker because it suddenly got real easy to get loot. It changed the economy midstream, which is is pretty unusual. Um, another thing is they they probably had four times the content when they shipped right. versus any other game, and uh, it turned out that was uh, appreciated and valuable uh, to users. And they went to um, 
um, a lower graphic spec than we thought was getawayable with at the time. Right. So they um, uh, they did some unusual things. So interesting at, at Electronic Arts, um, every MMO we did, except for Ultima Online, um, was developed by people who hadn't previously worked, hadn't previously led a MUD. It was, uh, and I'd say deep down, the EA's unfortunate experience is uh, we developed MMOs by people who kind of thought that online play was going to be more casual right. than traditional video game play. With Majestic, Sims Online, those were designed to play not very, not very much time. And so we found with Ultima Online, watching EverQuest, watching Galaxies, watching Pogo, is people are playing 15, 20 hours a week. And if they, if the bulk of people aren't playing that much time, they don't like it. Right. So are we seeing now, you know, sort of reigniting that spark of interest in doing those games? Because you know, people well, are the, away the, from the, I think the most successful MMO launch this year is Xbox Live 360. That's got uh-huh. Microsoft's. I think that's the uh, the best interactive product of the last five years, or last three years anyway. Right. And um, that's got all the all the learning from. Uh, Online community. It's got multiple kinds of scoring. It's got easy setup. And we're seeing, you know, like, a, you know, microtransactions, as Jim mentioned. I mean, a lot of, you know, ideas of, you know, other ways to sort of get more money out of users, not just in a, you know, box product for $60, but, you know, being able to, you know, increase the average revenue per user. And I think, you know, for some people here in the audience, I'm sure they're looking at the gaming space and saying, hey, you know, we know they're big publishers, you know, they're Hollywood, you know, studios getting involved. But what are the opportunities, do you think, right now for, you know, the people in the audience who are thinking about, you know, how should I get involved in the gaming business? What, you know, a lot of people are talking about, you know, yeah, you mentioned PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, you know, a lot of the smaller downloadable games, Sony Online's done some of those. And, you know, it's, these are games that are downloadable for 5 or $6.00 that you can, you know, download instantly online, and they're much smaller budgets than, you know, a $20 million epic game that, you know, EA or Warner or Lucas would do. Um, what what are the big opportunities? Samantha, what do you think? There's a ton of opportunities. You know, the big epic games are appealing. The small games are appealing. I mean, it, there are so many different directions to go in microtransactions online. I think that people need to find the piece of the industry that they're passionate about, whether it's the creative side that is drawing them. Is it the deal side, putting deals together? Is it what's going on overseas? That's, I think, a key driver to me. Where Where is their interest? And then go there. Don't, you know, try and find something you're passionate less about and make yourself work in that arena. It, it just right. never works. I actually, I mean, this industry is a lot less structured in than, say, film or television or music, even. In, in the regard for, for an MBA opportunity, there are lots and lots of jobs that you can create with a handful of guys and not that much money that can become immediately relevant in a way that, you know, unless you, you know, you find a million bucks and you think you can get yourself into Sundance, it's pretty tough to, to break into creation in the film business in the same way that you could form a development company. So I think the creative opportunity in the game space is actually so much broader in, in, in large part because it, it's all. No, I mean, but the film is we're seeing people you know putting stuff on YouTube and you know Lonely Girl and I mean there's you know that you know things. Yeah, but are, Lonely Girl was a, what, Lonely Girl was a produced piece of product. Right. Right. But. But there's no way the cost of you know doing. And they didn't make any money on it. Right. Yeah. Right? But it'll lead yeah. to you know, a lot of deals. Well, they they got an agent. Okay. Right. But that that isn't that isn't the same as like basically deve- you know that isn't. That's paying 115 or 105 grand to go to USC film school. <laughs> or spending a million bucks and then having Sundance tell you, I'm sorry, you're not good enough. I mean, I, I think you can get a game out there on Xbox Live for a lot less than that, and you can certainly get a, a game up on, on any number of network game sites and get a bunch of, you know, I mean, you can come up with your version of Mario Kart in Korea for a lot less. And if if you're interested, or in, people, you know, people are also you know, user created. You look at like you know the the Sims or some of these other games, and people you know finding ways to you know create you know content for these games or mods as people call them. That, you know people can put out online, get discovered by a game company, or even you know find ways to monetize that. No, I mean, one of the Amer- interesting Amer- things is that uh, working at a development studio is we're actually hiring a fair number of people with no formal educational training. We hire a lot of modders, right. and I think that's rare uh, across multiple 
multiple industries, the game space is still young enough where you can have absolutely no education and just make a bunch of mods and work your way up the ladder into success. And that's an exciting industry to be in where that can happen. Well, there's also still a phenomenon going on in this industry where you can be an MBA and go off with a couple of guys like Yair said and come up with some great ideas and even some technology. And, you know, if Bing hasn't bought you out, somebody else might want to buy you out. And there's, a, there's an economic chain there where it's not quite what the studios in Hollywood are, are doing in the film business nowadays. Um, so, you know, there's a tremendous opportunity there just economically as well if you just... Right. So I'd, I'd add one more thing for people who are good with numbers or econometricians. Um, there's an opportunity, a free economics opportunity in gaming. The um, um, the dollars per hour of gameplay in video games since I've been in the business in the early 80s, it was always 50 cents to a dollar an hour for a package game. And uh, when people are paying uh, $15 a month and paying 80, playing $80 a month on Warcraft, it kind of changes the economics. Uh, something like uh, John Madden football or Battlefield uh, that has, uh, where people are playing 100 and 200 hours and still playing, f paying $50. Um, there needs to be a new monetization strategy. So people who can think about uh, media customers and also money, there's an art form of remonetizing uh, new media. And you I ever think, see like people are going to subscribe to keep, they want to keep playing Madden, oh, you know, month after month? Well, the, the, you know, for those of you who've taken like negotiation uh, classes at Stanford, you know, there's this theory of there's a walkaway price at both ends and the negotiation has to happen somewhere in the middle. Well, right now, the the range of what consumers are willing to pay and what traditionally is charged, it's a huge range, and there's an art form of figuring out something in the middle that dramatically changes uh, the profits to the content makers right. uh, without adversely affecting and actually probably improving um, uh, the experience and the happiness of users. And... Uh, it's hard for people who've been doing this for 10 or 20 years to uh, think creatively even about... Are the, e are, sorry, are the economics broken, though, in the business now? The idea of a $60 box product that's going to cost, you know, 10 to $15 million to make, and, you know, it might work great for a blockbuster like Halo. I, I think the economics of new media are not yet invented. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, we, we, we sell... To, when we, we just launched an, an MMO last month, and we sold... 55% of the SKUs digitally. Right. So I, I wouldn't say that's broken. I was just saying that, that there's no shelf space constraint now. I mean, right. I, I think that the rules are wide open for a lot of people. I think the one place where people take advantage of this arbitrage is in the whole gray market, market in virtual goods. Right. You take You take an element from EverQuest that would take you 500 hours to get, and you can flip it to somebody for 500 bucks. And that's part of what's what's going on in that space. But yeah. there are much more efficient ways to deal with that. So when you guys look at the business right now, we talked a little bit about, you know, Jimmy mentioned some of the challenges the business faces going forward, you know, about growing the market. What do you, all four of you, what do you see as sort of the, the biggest hurdle or challenge that the industry has to contend with if it's going to continue to grow, if it's going to continue to be this, you know, hot new form of entertainment that everyone wants to get into? Is there sort of this, you know, freight train that just is sort of, you know, coming down the tracks that the industry has to, you know, deal with that they're not dealing with right now? Well, look, I mean, I'm, I'm always the lone wolf on this thing, but, you know, there, yeah, there's a buttload of stuff. I mean, look, there's piracy, there's IP protection, there's international globalization issues that we have be, not even begun to, to tackle, and new media always leads you into those, those uh, right. traps. Um, and then, you know, I go back to what I was saying before. Um, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I firmly believe that 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 what this industry that we're in should be the leading edge of entertainment. And uh, what does that mean? It just means that you know, most that, that compelling it, that, or most no, accessible. No, that, that in any given day, the same framework of, of mind share of entertainment that anyone goes through, from I'm going to watch a movie or I'm going to listen to some music to right. I'm going to play a, some kind of a game is at an equal par, and right now it's not. And, um, and why isn't it? I mean, what's, what's been holding it back, do you think? Well, it's the evolution of this industry. But right. uh, again, I, you, know, uh, you know, stopping short of inciting riots, my, my personal view is, is that it's, it's, a, it's an, um, 
uh, not a very evolved industry. It's unsophisticated. It's embryonic. Right. And, you know, um, it's, it's something that, you know, has stagnated to a degree. Right. And for all of the great things that, that everyone on this panel are doing, um, you know, it's got to it's got to go way beyond that. And and I think everyone has that intent, but we've got to figure out ways to do that. And that means taking risk. It means not following the studio model, which is risk averse. It means making some tough investments where you've got to. It means swinging for the fences. It means, right. you know, all of those kinds of things. And unless everyone ponies up to do that, um, you know, we're not we're going to do that. We also have issues around very real issues around government regulation. We face them every day. In every state of this union, there are bills pending to regulate the sale of our product. Uh, there, this is a, a, a right now an industry that's a political hot potato between both the extreme right and the extreme left and the middle uh, because uh, it's hot. And to the degree that, that movies have ducked under and, and gotten out of being, you know, the, the, the the perpetrators of modern evil to the youth, you know, video games now are that. And so there, there's all these kinds of issues, all of which are, are addressable, um, but, you know, it's getting that momentum behind it and focused in the right direction to do that. So being, you know, EA has obviously been around for, you know, decades, and you guys have been on the leading edge of the set. Centuries. <laughs> <laughs> they're, just, they're just digging just up know. the foundation exactly. of That's early right. EA buildings <laughs> under, under ancient Rome. But do you see, I mean, somebody, you know, something like Jim says, that, you know, the industry hasn't, you know, is still embryonic. Do you agree with that or do you, do you think, you know, is, is that sort of a condemnation of EA and not pushing the industry far enough? Or you know, the, what's what's held back the industry or what's held back EA? Or is that just the natural evolution? That's just the pace that it's, you know, where the industry is where it should be. Um, you know, they, um, in business school, you learn a lot about uh, market share and market sizing. And uh, the whole trick about making sure you're in the transportation business and not the railroad business. And um, the games business ha is uh, flat and isn't, isn't growing as fast as other forms of new media. Uh, if you think, if you call it interactive entertainment and include MySpace and include uh, um, YouTube watching and creation. So if you, if you more broadly look at interactive entertainment, um, the the uh, consumer usage is skyrocketing. Consumer, um, so I pay a lot of attention. You know, um, uh, we'd like to get money from people over 25, but you know, their uh, uh, their days are past. So the future uh, really depends on uh, what 15 to 25 year olds are doing, and then how they're going to get obsoleted by their younger siblings. That's part of the problem with the games is I think people would, you know, in the past would play games, you know, sort of, you know, when they were. Teenagers and oh, that, they sort of leave uh, the business. Gaming, right? that, that's not the case anymore. Gaming is now uh, has become lifelong. But um, uh, for so people who are starting like that, then, right? I mean, as you get more uh, and more. So the hours are, right. the dollars aren't. Okay. And uh, if you look at 15 to 25 year olds in North America, um, the total media usage, um, the average person spending 50 hours a week on media and 30 hours. And um, they're giving up TV time. They're increasing, and they're they're flat on theatrical time. Um, they're up some on games, and they're way up on internet usage. So I would think more broadly about internet as uh, as a new uh, new form of medium. That is the growth, mm -hmm. and uh, the monetization there is all over the place. So somebody like Google figures out a great monetization model. There's a bunch of other usages going on where the monetization model is sell to News Corp. And that's what I said. People, people out there who uh, get drilled on, uh, on economics and finance and consumer behavior, there's huge opportunities in uh, uh, monetizing and setting, setting business practice standards in new media. Because the consumer usage is skyrocketing. So what, what should the game industry be doing then? I mean, you, you know, those are the facts. So what's what's the opportunity? Oh, well, what's you got to build games that have uh, something like Facebook in it. You got to have something like YouTube in it. Uh, you got to have something like text messaging in it. Um, you've got to, you know, at least those, and you have to be able to play a game. You, you've got to uh, uh, build games to be satisfying in 30 to 300 second chunks. As well so, as so the industry kind of missed this user-generated revolution. I mean, you know, you, everyone's talking about you know, yeah, Facebook, MySpace, YouTube. Yeah, but to me, to me, those are those are 
That's an implementation issue. That's a tactical issue. At the end of the day, entertainment is about one thing. It's the DNA. It's about story and character. That's it. That's what this industry has missed. Now, we have the opportunity now to do that in those ways that Bing's talking about. I don't disagree with that in any way whatsoever. But at the end of the day, content is king. It always will be king. You guys have learned that, hopefully. That's not change. That will never change. We've got to make the content out so the there. stories haven't been compelling enough? Is that, I mean, what's been... Well, I, I, I think that, I mean, look, this, this panel is a rarity for a game industry panel and in that you have a woman on the panel. Right. I mean, let's just face facts, all right? I mean, yeah, we can talk about The Sims and we can talk about Pogo, right. but, you know, 75% of the industry revenues aren't generated by chicks. Yeah. And the, right. the, the population of the world doesn't match up with that. Okay, so that's a real limitation on the industry vis-a-vis... You know other entertainment genres. I, I think that's that's a big unaddressed component. I also think that yeah, there are older people that are gamers, but I think that um, there are limitations to, to game consumption in terms of ease of use. I mean that's one one of the, the, the big things that WoW had going for it vis-a-vis EQ or Star Wars Galaxies is it's easy to play. Right. And and I think that um, one of the things that you you experience if you play Madden as you know. Somebody who plays Madden regularly, or somebody who just picked it up, they're, they're playing two completely different games, yeah. and 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 that's actually one of the great things about Madden is that you can be a guy who basically doesn't know that there, are, you know, how many different routes your your tight end can run versus a guy who can basically alternate his defensive scheme to every single thing you come up with. And but there are not a lot of games that have that depth and Easy range. To learn, hard to master. E, e, well, yeah, yeah, like the classic games, right? right? Like chess, like yeah. you know, and 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 so those kind of things in terms of the quality of the content experience are still yet to be defined in a lot of genres in the games business, and especially for women. Right. And and you know, and if if you can't create a universal experience that basically applies equally to, to both genders, then you'll never be the defining edge of entertainment. But I think there are components that, that, that can be, and I also do think that it's a lot easier to integrate feature components of MySpace and YouTube and text messaging into a game than it is into a, te- into a TV show or a movie Right. And so I, I think inherently a lot of these, you know, internet community features are going to find their way into all aspects of gameplay because it people will bring it with them, people's expect and people will naturally integrate it into their gameplay experience in the same way they integrate music, right? I mean, the, if you look at the level of music, well, MMOs have a lot of that stuff already, I think, right? I mean, you know, in terms of user content, you know, being involved with some of them. And, but it's it's not it's not you know I mean you're you're still playing you know guy in tights with a broadsword right. you you're 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 not it's not video it's it's not as real time it's it's not you right. as much as it's a, a fairly narrowly defined avatar and a fairly narrowly but defined something like world. Second Life I think that's you know yeah, I, I, I guess I'm I'm I gotta say, I'm not a really big believer in the hype around Second Life right. I think there's been a ton of hype and I God bless them I think they're doing a great job on the PR front I, I don't see the concurrent usage levels that right. come close to a lot of real MMOs where people are spending a lot of time playing the game. Right. So Samantha, uh, you know, yeah, you brought up a good point there. I mean, is that that's something that you think about about how to, you know, grow the audience? I do. I have to because I am often on panels like this, and nearly 95% of them, I'm the only woman in every case. And right. I always encourage everyone to promote diversity in the industry. I could be wrong about this, but my feeling is that a 30, 35 year old game developer is probably going to have a hard time understanding what a 20 year old woman wants. And so, old men can't. so exactly. I argue a man can't understand a woman, and a woman can't understand a man. So having some diversity across. Men are a lot uh, simpler. There you go. <laughs> I defer to you. So having more diversity in the industry is a key component, I think, to being able to appeal to larger audiences. And having more international perspective and not so much of a North American perspective, I think, is also key as well. It's not just a gender issue; it's a cultural issue as well. And that's really key. We need, we absolutely need to do that to take this industry and expand it and get new consumers in. And, and people t- talk about that. I mean, they've been, you know, 
lots of stories of you know her interactive and all these other companies that are sort of, you know focusing purple moon yeah that's like you know, all that stuff that's sort of trying to focus on women and you know that doesn't seem to ever work and I mean, the Sims I, that was never designed as a game for women it was you guys were I think surprised right how well it did with with females um, let's see. We had we we had some success previously. I think 25% of SimCity customers were female. Okay. Uh, the open-endedness and the creativity. But uh, we thought about Sims as just trying to be a great people game and make it as broad as possible. We consciously uh, tried to make it a game for architects, interior decorators, um, storytellers, and strategy game players. But, it started uh, before, very before, sort of male dominated, and then over time it became. It started you know, early right? adopter dominated. Right. And in in uh, consumer electronics and games, really adopters tend to be 15 to 25 year old males. Right. But um, we didn't talk a lot about um, um, gender appeal in the development of the Sims. Just. Right. You know, people talk about the holy grail of let's make a game for women. And right, and that's the thing is I think people have tried that and, you know, not had success. Which we're figuring but out that's like doing. all content, right? right? I mean, I don't think George Lucas sat around making Star Wars and saying, I want it to appeal to women. I want it to last forever and define a whole new universe. He just had a really great story he wanted to tell, and he came up with something that was broad. Right. So I, I, I think... a killer story. Well, right, okay. except... What this industry does now is the killer stories are thought about in the context of an 18 to 24 year old kid, who because that's the right. No one wants to take the risk. Of and no one wants to know. take the risk of going out and doing it because the track record hasn't been there. But it's a self fulfilling prophecy. Right. Somewhere someone will take the risk, and it'll happen. You know, and and, and again, it's got to be a different thing. It's the romantic women, comedy game. Women are different. Well, I don't know. I, I I don't know what it is, but Samantha's dead on right. I mean, mm. you know, I I know if I look at my guys. In our dev studio, I mean, I would not task them with making a women's game. They would right. have no, no, there's no beyond, forget it, you know. And so it, it's like, you know, let's, if, we're, if you're going to do that, let's figure that 